It's now my honor to introduce uh, our opening presenter this morning. Our, fall, our leadership team uh, from SciTech had the honor of, of uh, interacting with Dr. Roberts yesterday. Uh, Dr. Terry Roberts is, was one of the Little Rock Nine, an unimaginably brave group of African-American high school students who walked through the taunts and stones and fear, to and fear to desegregate Little Rock Central High School in 1957. He completed his junior year only to have Arkansas shut down its public schools to avoid further desegregation. Dr. Roberts went on to complete a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology at California State University at Los Angeles in 1967. He earned a Master of Science in Social Welfare in 1970 from UCLA and earned a PhD in psychology from Southern Illinois University in 1976. He was awarded uh, the Springgarn Medal by the NAACP and the Congressional Gold Medal by President Bill Clinton. In addition to being a university professor, a practicing psychologist, and managing a consulting practice, he's found time to serve as a consultant on desegregation practices for the Little Rock School District. Yeah. Very, very important, very, very important. He's published two books, Lessons from Little Rock and Simple, Not Easy, Reflections on Community Social Responsibility and Tolerance. Copies of Lessons from Little Rock are available as a gift to each of you, courtesy of one of our sponsors, Barney and Barney. Colleagues, please help me welcome Dr. Terry Roberts. It's probably, okay, thanks. You know, one of the crazy things about life <clears throat> is you never know what you're going to say when you stand in front of a group of people like this. But the words always seem to come. In fact, as I listened to Calza, I was thinking, there are three things that stand out <clears throat> that have to do with freedom. All of us need these freedoms in order to have what many call a quality life. The first is the freedom to dream. Everybody starts that way. In fact, the freedom to dream is perhaps one of the more universal freedoms because even if you are incarcerated, enslaved, solitary confinement, in very dire circumstances, you can usually manage to dream. Now, it's not universal. There are some people whose ability to dream has been quenched by the circumstance. Fortunately, that's a small group worldwide. But the freedom to dream, it gives you opportunities to think about what tomorrow will bring. Think about a cows are dreaming in Somalia, and you get a very vivid picture. And think about other people. I might include myself in that, having had my origin in a place called Little Rock, Arkansas, which was not my choice, by the way. I would have chosen quite a different place uh, <laughs> to start life. But as fate would have it, I had to deal with Arkansas I gave a lecture last Sunday at a college, and in the audience was a resident of Little Rock, a man about my age, perhaps a few years older, who came up and wanted me to know that he knew my story and that he wanted me to know that the reason Little Rock was chosen as one of the early sites for school integration was because of Little Rock's liberal attitude. <laughs> and that it was successful because the people of Little Rock embraced the concept and were fully supportive of our endeavor. I asked him if he were a member of the Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> Very interesting perspective. And by the way, a lot of folk are, are now writing tomes and revising history, so this message is not unusual. The man who was senior class president during 1957-58, a man by the name of Ralph Brody, if you want to Google him, that's Ralph, B-R-O-D-I-E, has written a book wherein he talks about how welcoming the students were who had actually planned a party for us. Unfortunately, it was canceled. But it, all, the thing, all the mechanisms were in place, and we were to have been feted and regaled with all kinds of uh, welcoming bags and goodie bags. Who knows what we might have had had the party not been canceled. But even there in Little Rock, the nine of us had the freedom to dream, and we dreamed a lot, believe me. We dreamed about life outside Little Rock. One of my dreams was that I would eventually find a place where there were people who were rational and reasonable, and I, I would find those folk, and, and they would be my people. 
because the folk in Little Rock certainly were not. The second freedom is the freedom to learn. Think about how serious that is. In this country, for years and years, it was against the law for people like me to learn. Against the law. It was against the law for us to participate in the educational activities that were available to the more preferred group in our society. The freedom to learn is not universal. The freedom to learn is one of those freedoms that is very elusive for so many people around the world. It's so important to recognize this, and especially in the work that you do, because a lot of your students, by virtue of their circumstance in life, may not be secure with their own freedom to learn. They may feel that learning is reserved for other people. I told a story yesterday, as I was talking to the group, about a young man I encountered at a high school in Cincinnati. Young black kid in a very mixed school population, culturally and ethnically, great mixture. But he raised his hand at one point and he wanted to know why I, as a speaker, use so many big words. And he says, because that shows that you are acting as if you were white. And I thought to myself, his freedom to learn has been truncated. He doesn't understand that learning cannot be color-coded in the universe. You cannot ever think of learning as something that is the sole province of persons other than yourself. The third freedom, the freedom to achieve. Because once you've started with a dream and you have the freedom to learn, now you're ready to achieve. But that one is the most elusive. Even now, in this year, 2013, you come with your dreams, you come with your well-prepared learning background, but the doors may not be open for you. And perhaps that's the one we have to spend most of our time on as we counsel the kids that we work with. And I'm including myself in this now. I was just telling Larry that I recently joined the board of a charter school in Inglewood, California. It's the Grace Hopper STEM Academy. Keep in mind the Grace Hopper STEM Academy because we have big dreams and we will be splurged all over the nation at some point. I'm thinking the initial school will be in Inglewood and we will be opening schools nationwide before too long. Talk about dreaming. <laughs> My board members would love to hear that. In any case, the freedom to achieve is the one that, as I said, is so elusive, but the one that we need to help kids understand. With my own kids, I have two kids, my wife and I, when they were first born, had a meeting, she and I, determined to determine whether or not we would give our kids the information that we had acquired over the years that we had been alive in this country, or whether we would shield them from all of that madness, move into a middle-class enclave, put them in private schools, monitor their life's activities so that they would not be impacted by the very vicious edges of racism. And that conference lasted about a nanosecond. And the result was we would tell them everything we knew to prepare them. Why? Because they needed to prepare their own survival kit. As parents, we could not be there with them. You know, when I read the works of Khalil Gibran, especially when he talks about parenting and children, he says that parents are considered as the bow from which these kids, the arrows, are shot forth. And they will go into regions where parents cannot follow. And so they can't go out ill-equipped, as some do. In fact, a lot of my age group contemporaries at that same time that my kids were growing up said, we are going to do what you have rejected. We're going to send our kids to private schools. We're going to move to the middle class enclaves. And I said, no, no, you, will, you are making a mistake. I will see them in therapy. And, <laughs> <coughs> and it was true. I treated a number of those kids in therapeutic environment simply because they were ill-prepared for what they met. Can you imagine going out into this society ill-informed about the reality of who we have been and who we are? And what happens, of course, psychologically, is you look first to self to find the reasons. What's wrong with me? Why am I not acceptable? And that is so devastating. But if you know in advance what's going on, your shield is already there. You can rebuff those arrows and move on. You can navigate this terrain with some facility because you have the wherewithal to do it. So again, in terms of how you deal with your students. Now, in any group of people, you will find never unanimity of thought, of course, but you will find very different ideas. This may sound strange for a group like this, but some of you harbor ideas that are not that healthy for the students you work with. I don't know who you are, and I'm not asking you to identify yourselves. 
but pay attention. <laughs> because what I want to challenge you to do is change that way of thinking. The kids that you work with are not hopelessly lost. I remember reading a novel once in a collection, it wasn't, wasn't a novel, short stories, by this great guy, James McPherson, by the way, it's called Elbow Room. If you have a chance, if you have time to read, pick that book up, Elbow Room by James McPherson. And he's written other books as well, so read them all. In fact, here's an assignment. I want you to read one book a week from now on, in addition to everything else that you've been assigned, okay? Why? Because you need to know. But at any rate, McPherson, in writing in this short story about Elbow Room, talks about being on a lonely highway in Maryland and being stopped by a state trooper. Just the two of them out on this lonely stretch of road next to a body of water. He steals himself because he knows he's about to have an encounter with someone for whom he's going to have to do the thinking. He's going to have to think for himself and the state trooper because the state trooper brings to him a reptilian brain that sees him not as a true human being but as someone who is utterly dispensable. Knowing for his survival he's going to have to navigate this with care, he gets out of the car and demonstrates docility as best as he can. And when the state trooper comes and immediately begins to unscrew his license plate and fling it into the body of water nearby, his first response is not, officer, why are you doing that? But no, no, officer, I'm so glad you did that. I was meaning to do that myself. Sounds crazy, but you know what you have to do to survive in certain circumstances. It may sound unusual to some of you, but these are the kinds of things that have happened, that do happen, and that will happen in these United States of America. At any rate, he gets out of it by agreeing to be arrested, thinking that if he could just get to the station, there'll be more same reptilian brains, but sometimes in groups, they are reluctant to act for fear that someone else may be harboring a true human brain. In any case, he gets a taxi to take him back to where he needs to go. The cab driver says to him in a friendly voice, I know you've had a lot of trouble with those guys because they just don't like black people. But I know what you've been through, so it's not your fault that you're an animal. And I, <laughs> this was a helpful statement. In any case, the freedom to achieve includes learning and knowing all about those things and moving beyond them. When we were in Little Rock, as young kids, we were privileged to have a group of community people, teachers, friends, and relatives who were joined in concert to help us understand, young people that is, starting with my first grade teacher who said to all of us six-year-olds gathered in her presence, you kids have to take executive control of your own learning. But beyond that, these teachers in our all-black school system were the literal cream of the crop because with segregation defined as separate but equal, black people could not get jobs, they could not be employed any place except in schools where there were all black kids, or with the U.S. Postal Service. The middle class jobs in that era were at school teaching, postal service. Why? Because the postal service was federally run and desegregated to a degree. In any case, understanding their plight, they were rightfully angry, but realized that if they let their anger overcome them, they would be absolutely useless. So they agreed to pool their resources and force us toward excellence. So in the all-black school in Little Rock, we actually got a much better education than we would have gotten in the white school where we would not have been loved individuals, as was proven once we got to Central. I say that also to alert you to the fact that the student population that you're dealing with needs your support. They need you to believe in them as individual people who have the right not only the freedom, but the right to dream, to learn, and to achieve. The students in my elementary school, all black Gibbs Elementary, all black Dunbar Middle School, all black Horace Mann High, all of them were working together to make certain that one Terry Roberts could have as much of those freedoms as could be realized in his brief life on this planet. You know, I often talk about the lifespan being from zero to 80, and I'm at 71 now, so I'm getting a little closer to the edge, and it's scary to be honest, <laughs> because I like life. I like what it has to offer, and I'd like to be around a bit longer. So 
If you see me doing anything destructive, warn me. Once we got to Central High School, we were prepared in a sense because of that foundational experience we had in the all-black schools. People often ask, how were you able to deal with that coming from what they presumed to be ineffective black schools? Not true, in every case. You know, there's a concept first given voice to by a fellow by the name of James McCune Smith back in the late 17th century. He said, black people in this country are differentially opp oppressed. That's a beautiful way of putting it, differentially oppressed. Not everybody's experience has been the same. And that's also important because we, the people, have a tendency to treat people as parts of groups. I know about you people, that sort of thing. My neighbor <laughs> came over once, a woman who lives in Pasadena. We, we live in that neighborhood no longer, but we did live there. And she came over one day and told us that she had cast a vote for us in our favor in the Neighborhood Watch Council meeting. And my wife and I, of course, uh, gave her very effusive thanks for such an activity. But then we were curious, what, what was this vote about? And of course, the vote was about whether the neighbors would support our being in the neighborhood. That was very, very interesting uh, for a number of reasons. But it showed how we were considered to be part of a group. That's the general gist of this story. How else would that have transpired? What did we represent to those folk? They, had, they hadn't met us. They didn't know us. They'd not come over with the welcome wagon or given us the goodie bags that you often get when you move into a new neighborhood. In fact, I always say to people, if, if Terry Roberts and his wife moves next door to you and you are prone to move, don't move. Don't move. Stay put. Come over and bring a housewarming gift, something quite expensive, and, and we can talk. <laughs> get to know each other. I love getting gifts. <laughs> That reminds me as I'm talking about another episode about that. We moved into a home in southern Illinois when I was in grad school. And uh, we purchased a house simply because when you move from California to Illinois, you can buy anything you want. Uh, <laughs> but the welcome wagon person did not come to us. One of our neighbors came and, and said, well, how'd you like the welcome wagon and all the goodies and coupons? Really? It was. And he said, well, yeah, and at that moment, at that very moment, the welcome wagon person was across the street at a person who just moved in across the street doing the welcome wagon activity. But they saw us and the other neighbor who was pointing out, and they quickly zoomed down the street so they wouldn't have a chance to, to meet us. We never did meet the welcome wagon person in Carbondale, Illinois. <laughs> well, that was a special place anyway, just to give you a glimpse of we the people from that region. When we moved in, a neighbor, another neighbor, ah, these neighbors, this neighbor came over and said to, no, said to me, you know, I can't really do this, but you know, you have three strikes against you. Okay, sort of did it. <laughs> what do you think, Katie, do I get a, <laughs> pretty close, okay. <laughs> any rate, three strikes. Strike number one, you're from California. Oh, a lot of antipathy toward West Coast people. He said, I understand even the men out there wear shorts. I said, well, <laughs> <coughs> yeah. Some of, <laughs> watch out. He said, the second thing is you're connected with the university. There was this ongoing antagonism between the town and the university. They felt invaded every fall. And he said, the third thing is you're black. And he said, now, because you're black, if I were you, I would not ever go into the town of Heron. Heron was juxtaposed to Carbondale toward the west. I thanked him for his sage advice. Then I went home. It was about sundown at that time. I told my wife to put a sweater on. We had to drive over to Heron. <laughs> she said, why? I said, no, no big deal. We're just going to check out the environment. <laughs> Now, you see, my philosophy is you never, ever live in fear of the dragon. You go meet the dragon in his lair. And so we did. We drove into Heron and drove around and looked. And it was just your usual run-of-the-mill redneck town, so it wasn't a big deal. We knew how to deal with a circumstance like that. And so, see, from that early preparation, how to navigate the terrain, and you have to know where you are. So my advice is if you know there are dragons in your neighborhood, develop acquaintanceship with the dragon. Why? Practical. If the dragon is known to walk abroad at noon seeking lunch, it is imprudent for you to take a stroll through town at noon. Wait until 2.30 so you're sure the dragon has fed and is now napping and you are safe. 
to a certain degree, although dragons are tricky. But in any case, <laughs> more about that in a later lecture. So back to Central High School. We get there with all of this background that we bring, and we are met with all kinds of stuff. And one of the things that we're met with is this incredulous look that says from the voice of one student, we have been taught all of our lives that you people are inferior to us. We have been taught that you can't learn, that you refuse to learn, that you don't have the capacity to learn, and yet here you are showing us up. You know what happened as a consequence? The anger level rose and the antipathy levels rose and they were more vicious toward us than they might have been otherwise. Minnie Jean often says, oh, how they hated me. Minnie Jean's very interesting. She's part of Little Rock Nine. She's a woman, and by the way, in this book, I profile each of the other eight in the back. And I forget exactly what I say about her, but you'll get a sense of this woman as you read that. They've all read these, by the way, and have all signed off, except Gloria. Gloria says I didn't get her right. She's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I know my people. <laughs> In any case, whenever we walked into any, ca any classroom at Central, some students got up in preparation to leave, but before they left, chose to give us their best thinking about us as people, about people like us, about our families. They were seemingly well informed about our respective mothers. They gave us uh, travel advice. And then <laughs> said, we, we are not going to stay in school with you. They left. Now, I always thought that was perhaps one of the most unusual things that happened in that entire year. Here were young kids who gave up their freedom to learn in the name of segregation forever. They never came back. Those who remained, however, were frightened, angry, upset, bewildered, and engaged in the most horrendous activities you can imagine. You know, anything that you can think of that one human being might possibly do to another, they did to us. And they did it with a sense of impunity because there was no recourse for us and there was no sense of justice at all. We were on our own. In fact, during that year, you might think of us as the Little Rock One nine times rather than the Little Rock Nine because we were separated. We were assigned homerooms alphabetically by last name and further by class standing, 10th, 11th, or 12th grade. We were divided up one senior, five juniors, three sophomores, and our names were all disparate, so we were assigned these different rooms. And your homeroom assignment gave you your class room assignments for the day. We rarely saw each other in a given day. Massive school, by the way. Very big school. If you haven't been there, and by the way, I urge you to visit because Little Rock Central High School is now a national park. It's also an operational school. But because it's a national park, you have the right to go there as an American citizen and visit. And there's a whole complex of things. Across the street, there's a museum complex. And on the other corner, there is uh, a park with all kinds of little mementos, and then a, a preserved uh, gas station, which in the past was a gathering place for some of the racist oppositionists. It has been preserved as well. So you get a sense of what was happening during that year. The National Park Service has also managed to purchase several of the homes immediately across the street on park from the school with the intention of purchasing all of that property, two blocks long, to preserve it as it was in 1957. Probably some merit in that. Not quite sure what. But in any case, uh, this is a truncated experience today because I have to jet out of here.